is to see one church, one body come together. This generation is hungry for God. This generation needs a move of God. And I believe that God is going to encounter you in a profound way. That the Lord is going to come and he's going to heal you. He's going to speak destiny over you. He's going to free you. And I just believe that God is going to mark you as you come before him and you just come and say, God, here I am. And so we have some really special friends that are going to be with us. We have Dave Ward from Bethel Church. We have Jessica Culianos from Jesus Image and Brian Barcelona from the One Voice Movement and Gen Z for Jesus. And this is going to be an incredible time where we get to come together as the body of Burkhardt County, as a group of wild and radical young people just saying, God, here I am, use me, mark me in any way that you want to, God. And we just want to invite you to come out to the field and meet us here again on February 29th to March 3rd. Come out and just see God mark you and encounter you in an incredible way. I see a generation that's led by the Holy Spirit, fixed on the face of Jesus, and in constant pursuit of the Father's heart. I see a generation just crying out for the Father's heart. I see a John 4 generation that says, But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship Him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Come on, come on. You guys don't know this, but that ending of the video is very special and I won't expose anyone. But I wanna say, um, Shelby and Juwan, could you just stand really quickly? I just wanna honor Shelby and Juwan. Yeah. And Summer in the back. Summer for faithfully leading. Come on, we have, <laughs> she loves it, she loves it. <laughs> Guys, they have been stewarding our, our youth ministry for over a year now, yeah. and we got incredible youth up here. But they decided during Jesus 23 in December, we were all pa passed out, but they were so hungry, they decided to go in the garage and worship. So that clip you heard was actually the youth worshiping by themselves before Jesus. And I believe, like Juwan said, it's a John Ford generation that the Father's looking for those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth, and it's happening. The youth are actually crying out for more of God, and He will meet them. And so I just wanna say, if you, uh, we do need moms and dads there too. You're not excluded if you're over the age of 30, 35. But we really felt like God wanted to encounter this generation, that we needed to make intentional space to say God sees you, He knows you, He wants to meet you. Because sometimes things have to happen outside of the comfort of their own churches or their own you know, families. We need those encounters with God that, are, that mark us forever. I just had a breakfast with a youth leader from another church. We've got youth leaders um, from all over the county that are bringing their guys, youth and young adult leaders. And we, we want the lost to come. We want the saved to come. We want everybody there because God is going to move. He's going to save. He's going to deliver. He's going to heal. This generation needs a power encounter with God. And I really believe this, this leader was sharing with me. She said, I feel like, I said, what do you feel like this generation needs? And she said, you know, I keep hearing that there's a secular song called, What Was I Made For? And she said she saw the video and this, this artist was singing it and she saw all these young people weeping while she was singing it. And she just said, I started to cry and go, God, a generation is saying, what was I made for? Come on. And they aren't gonna find it in that arena. They're gonna find it on the field, pouring their heart out before the Lord and God will meet them and mark them forever. So guys, we're actually doing this event for free because we believe, Pastor and I were talking and he's like, well, do you want the lost to come? I said, yeah. He said, then we have to make it free. That doesn't mean we're rolling in the deep, guys. We're believing. God gave us a word 
that he would meet them here. And we believe that if we're faithful, God will supply all of our needs. So if you ever feel inclined to give towards that, we welcome it because we're, we're fronting all of this right now because we believe that God really wants to meet these kids. And we chose people that burn with the heart of God, that love young people, that speak life and destiny over them. And I believe that whatever you invest, God, you, you will see the reward. Yeah. Come on, there's rewards we're gonna see before the throne room of God. And I, I just believe everything that you sow, everything you give of your time, I'll send a volunteer sheet, those who love the volunteer forms, I'll be sending those your way. But God is gonna meet these young people and he's gonna change their lives forever because this is what they need. They need a space for that. You know, when you give, you invest. I said, when you give, you invest. You're partnering. You know, even when you work stocks, what you're doing is you're partnering with whatever company you're buying stock in because you believe that they have what it takes to succeed. And in their success, right. you get return on your investment. Well, let me tell you, God's more than a company. And when you give into the kingdom, you're investing into his plans, right. his future projections, and that in turn, you're going to get a return on your investment. He uses words like press down, shaking together, and running over. He uses terms like 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. He gives indication that there is a return, not just on money of dividends, but what you realize, what you may fail to realize is Whatever return that you get here on the earth is not nearly compared to the compounded interest on your return that you're going to get in eternity. Come on. We are not only giving for something here to realize, but we're also storing up in heaven That's right. treasures yeah. and that where, where moth and rust doesn't corrupt where the devil can't come in and steal from you. Yes. And when you get there, and, and here's the deal, the dividends in heaven are, are men and women. Yeah. What I'm saying is you give so that the kingdom of God can grow and so that people can be facilitated to do what some of us won't even do in our own backyards, and that is share the gospel and do things, and step out of the boat. 95% of Christians today have never led anyone to Christ. 95% of the people who've come to Christ have never yet experienced the privilege of praying with another person as they receive Christ. You have not been blessed until you've had the opportunity to look into the eyes of a person who's beheld Jesus for the first time and says, I want to give. Come on, you remember that day for you? I want to give my life to Jesus. You want to make that possible. When you get to heaven, you're going to find great returns on your investments in the kingdom. Yeah. And God takes great note when you and I invest of our time, our talent, our energy, and our resources. Amen. Amen. By the way, nothing is free. <coughs> Somebody has paid for whatever you got for free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Salvation is a free gift, which means you don't have to pay for it. But salvation didn't come free. That's right. Salvation came at a great cost. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. We've been talking the last couple of weeks about mission and commission. And this morning, I want to share some scriptures with you. Juan was asking, he sent me a text just the other day, and he says, Pastor, what are some of your scriptures? Because mission is know him. Yeah. Commission is make him known. Yeah. You see that the, the vision, the heart, the mission of this house, the vision and the mission of this house is to, number one, know him. Yeah. Know him doesn't mean know about him. Know him means to encounter him. Yeah. I said encounter him. Experience him yeah. in your daily life intimately on an ongoing basis. And then the commission comes is to make him known. Yeah. Because he that's inhabited me by invitation now, as I realize who he is, I cannot help but make him known. John 17, three, I want to read you a couple of scriptures. Yeah. This is eternal life. Yeah. Are you ready? Everyone wants to know what eternal life is? Jesus said it in a sentence. 
this is eternal life. That they may know you, because he's talking to the Father, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Period. Yeah. It's eternal life. Are you living, do you know when eternal life begins? The moment Jesus comes in to your life, eternal life has begun. Anyone saved in this room this morning? Declare they're saved. Come on. So you're living, you've already begun the eternal life lifestyle. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Who, who am I? I'm a chosen generation. Yeah. I'm a royal priesthood. Are you, I'm, I'm God's special person. Are yeah. you with me? Yeah. I've been called out of what? Darkness. Come on, I've been called out of Darkness. into what? His, his marvelous light. light. What do you do in his marvelous light? I learn from him. I grow in him and then I make him known. Yeah. I learn from him and grow in him and then I make him known. John chapter 14. Verse five, Tom, Thomas is looking, seeing Jesus because he's you know, doubting Thomas, right? Which we know him by. And it wouldn't be great to have your, your reputation. I mean, everyone calls Don, you know, by Thomas. one moment. It means Didymus, means twin, but he's known for his doubt, not for his faith. following in faith. Because he said, I won't believe what you're telling me until I actually put my fingers into the holes in his hands and thrust my fist in his side. And you know what Jesus said? Touch me. See, put your finger in here. Yeah. Come on, are you with me? But Jesus says in verse six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. He said, if you had known me, he's talking to a man who just spent three years with him. Yeah. If you had known me, you would have known my Father. If you would have, if you, in the three years you spent with me, if you would have really encountered me, and learned from me, you would have encountered my father. Basically, I'm a chip off the old block. I'm just like my daddy. Are you hearing me? He, he said, if you had known me, you'd have known the father. You'd have known him who sent me. And, he, and then Philip says, show us the father. It's sufficient for us. Jesus said, I've been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? Yeah. He who has sent me, has seen the Father. Listen, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Can we say that? Can we say, if you've seen me, you've seen Jesus? Mm -hmm. I said, can we say, if you've seen me, you've seen Jesus? Come on, now we're not talking about perfection, but come on, has Jesus ever leaked out of your life anywhere? Can you ever say that there was a moment in your life that when somebody looked at you, they saw Jesus? Come on, we gotta be glimpses at least. Are you there? And Oh, come on, Jesus. Understand, to know him is the mission. To make him known is the commission. We want to send you out because God wants to send you out. In in Matthew Matthew 10, he says that he sends, first he says in Matthew 9, 38, he tells him, pray the Lord of the harvest that he'll send forth laborers in the harvest. Then immediately he says to the disciples, come here. We said, oh, I'm going to pray for laborers. No, 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 no. You can't pray for laborers until you want to be a laborer. Now, I mean, now just hear me a minute. Because the next thing he yeah. says in chapter 10, a few verses later, he says, come here. Yeah. Come here. I'm going to send you. Yeah. See, so if you're going to be praying for laborers, you're going to know what you're praying for because you're going to be one. Yeah. And then he sent them out yeah. two by two. Come on, say two by two. Two by two. He didn't tell you to do it all by yourself all the time. He sent them out two, two by, by two. two. And then in Luke, in Luke, now listen, do you realize that when in, in 
John chapter, Matthew chapter 10, when he sent them out two by two, they were with him a year and a half before he ever sent them out. You didn't know that, did you? They were with him a year and a half before he turned them loose two by two. When he sent the 70 out in the book of Luke in chapter 10, they had been around him for three, three years. He started sending them out six months before he laid his life down at the cross. And when he sent them out two by two, he called them together. Those were some of the labors that the 12 had been praying for for a year and a half while they were out doing the work that Jesus sent them out to do. And here's the thing. He didn't send them out until they were ready. And and you're never ready. Amen. (laughs) For anything. For anything. He sent them out when they were ready enough to be challenged to grow. You were ready enough to be challenged to grow. He didn't send you out because you were complete. No, he sent you out that you're as complete as you're going to get until you actually get your, get your feet into the fray of things, until you actually start facing things. You know about casting out a demon when someone starts manifesting, the pastor says, go over there and cast that demon out, and they leave you over there by yourself. Then you say, oh. I learned about casting out demons from that. I, well, I, I had an instruction. You, know, you can have all the instruction all day long. Everything we teach you is theory until you put it to practice. Everything you learned in high school was theory until you put it into practice. Everything you learned in college is theory until you put it into practice. Until you prove it for yourself, it's theory. It's all theoretical, mechanical. It's been proven by somebody else. But until you've proven it, your trust isn't going to be there until you know it's going to be there for you when you walk on that water. When you step out of the boat and you walk on the water and listen to me, that's why it's important that I prove him in my life. You know, we like to use the scripture in tithing, test me, try me, prove, test me, try me, prove me, saith the Lord now in this thing. Listen, God doesn't mind being tested by us. He just doesn't want us being testy with him while we're testing things. <laughs> test my truth, test my principles, test my word, but don't be testy with me. Are you hearing me? In the midst of that in our life, you and I prove him for myself. You build a track record with God. How is your track record with God going? Yeah. What is your win-loss record? You know what your win-loss record? My way, his way. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. I remember hearing this, hearing this in, the, in the human world. It's my way or the... My way. Wow, yeah. I'm not the only one. <laughs> Well, you know what? Jesus said there are two roads. One of them is a highway. Another one is a path. I said one of them is a highway and another one is a path. Unfortunately, the road to heaven isn't on I-95. It's on a back road, narrow, that leads you to life eternal and righteousness of him. And it's an interesting thing. He says, because he uses the statement, he says, many there be concerning the highway that go, that, that go, there, go there in. But the narrow gate is few there be that find it. Yeah. Mm. Which means that I need attention to detail as to making sure that I'm on the right path to make sure yeah. I'm going in the right direction yeah. so that I'll end up in the right place but on the highway i measure my success by the crowd that's around me hoping that they're going to get to the right destination we're on the byway which is the narrow way oftentimes i might find myself alone on the trail when i'm making decisions for myself because you're going to be faced if you're already faced but you're going to be faced with brothers and sisters in christ they're just as messed up as you were, probably just as much, if not more, or almost as bad as you are. They're going to give you their counsel and call it God, and you've got to have God's knowledge in your heart That's to know right. when you can pick and choose what you're hearing from those yeah. you're hearing from. You need to know what is the gospel and what is mixture. Yeah. Because oftentimes we have a tendency to share with each other out of a tainted well. Yeah. If I'm going through a tough time, 
I need to filter the water in my well before I share it with other people. Yeah, it, because my perceptions begin to become skewed. Yeah. And so I have a tendency to speak a truth with a slight twist to it. Yeah. Oh, that sounds like somebody I know in the garden. He's called the serpent. Yeah. And unfortunately, this child of light can twist a, something, a truth, just because I'm dealing with a tough situation. Yeah. And be well-meaning in all that I do, yes. but, but at the same time, be self-justifying in what I do. Yeah and corrupt my brothers and sisters and cause them to fall off the path for a while. Yes. And they have to wander back on their path because I stood in the way of a sinner. I sat in the seat of a mocker. I became the counsel of the ungodly. That's, yeah. By the way, that's Psalms chapter one. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of. You say, well, they're godly. No, godly doesn't mean you're saved. I said, godly doesn't mean you're saved. Godly means you're deliberately walking after the Lord and you guard what comes in and out of your mouth and you have a heart yeah. for the things of God even over the things that you're struggling with. That's good. Godly stays committed even when there's nothing in your life worth committing to except him. Godly is a decision. Not something you did just once. Godly is something you do every day. That's good. Part of the mission is understanding he saved me, yeah. Philippians 1, 6. But he began a good work. I said, he came in. Jesus, the carpenter, yeah. stonemason, whatever you want to call him. Yes. Yeah. The contractor is who he is. He's going to make you all that. I am made the righteous of God through Christ Jesus because I'm not going to be my own righteousness before God ever. Thank God. I said ever. Yeah. And, I'm, and I need him always. Yeah. And all while you're trying to help other people, you're still, you're still a project. Years ago, there was a song. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be because he's still working on me. That's so good. So... The mission never stops. Yeah. And the mission is you, is me. If you've met Jesus and Jesus is in you and you're in him, the mission never stops. That's right. You are complete, you are a complete work in her, him that's under construction. Mm -hmm. And you're not completed until you cross the finish line. That's so good, yeah. He sees me as completed because he's because he knows what he's looking for as the end result. It, yeah. When an artist paints a, paints a painting, they usually have an idea what they want it to look like before they start the canvas. Yes. When a yeah, person yeah. builds something, they have an idea. If you're going to build a doghouse, hopefully you know what that doghouse is going to look like before you start cutting lumber. Mm. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? You have a vision. Yeah. He has a vision. That's the completed picture. But until the picture is completed, the vision is not yet fulfilled. And he's not going to stop. Change is not change until change has completely made the change. Yes. Good. Is anyone here completely changed? No. no, I'm still changing work and process. Yeah. But I'm changing. I have been changed. I've been changed, rearranged, sometimes feel deranged, but I am gone that way <laughs> to what God has for me in my life. Are you with me? Yeah, yeah. But in the midst of my littleness becoming big, because he who is big has become big in me, now I can be big together with him, even though I'm not done. Yeah. Yeah, I think what we're talking about is the crucified life. Yes. So we talk about resurrection and we talk about crucifixion, right? So I'm dead to sin. That makes me alive in Christ. So we are crucifying our flesh daily. And Galatians 5, just to break it down practically, because I think one of the things that happens in the church world is we talk about the crucified life up here, and we don't actually break it down to where it hits home. So in Galatians 5, talking about living by the Spirit's power, because if you're a believer and you, you live a resurrected life, you get to live a life led by the Spirit. I said, you get 
to live a life led by the Spirit. You can choose to let sin rule your life. You know that? It's still a choice. Even, even though you said yes to Jesus at an altar, you can still let sin rule your life. It's still ultimately your decision who rules your life. And so in Galatians 5, verse 19, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, this is speaking to believers, okay? It's not speaking to unbelievers. When you as a believer follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry. Okay, idolatry is just putting anything in priority above God. It's not chipping away at little wooden idols like in the Old Testament. It's when you desire something and you prioritize something above God to the point that it holds your affection more than God does. That's idolatry. If you can't open your Bible, but you can binge watch Netflix for three weeks in a row, Netflix is an idol in your life. I know that sounds really like simple, but honestly, things in our life, our phones can become idols in our life. Sorcery, okay, sorcery, witchcraft. Gossip is witchcraft. Rebellion is witchcraft. When you have an attitude in your heart, in your heart that only God can see, but it'll begin to manifest in your actions where inside you're saying, eh, no way. Like I, I love pastor has this story and I'm gonna share it for you because I know it my whole life. When he was, <laughs> when he was serving on staff at a church, a pastor had asked him, you know, had, was making a decision that he didn't agree with, okay? But he was submitted. And he just said, hey, and this was behind closed doors, please don't ask me to hold the flag. Please don't ask me to lead the charge. But no one will ever know that I disagree. So what he was saying was, is you and I are good. Even though I don't agree with this, just don't ask me to be your poster child for the project, right? Just don't ask me to be that, but I will be behind you. I will support you. I will do whatever it takes because I'm submitted. Rebellion is when we in our hearts go, I don't want that. There's no way. My, my viewpoint is better. What I want is better. And you know what? You may not even say it outwardly. You may have side conversations. You may have the meetings after the meetings. Call up the phone, you know. Hey, did you hear what so-and-so did? That's rebellion. That's dissension. It's leprosy. And that's where the enemy comes in. That's witchcraft. Gossip is witchcraft. And we think it's just us venting. But actually, it poisons us. And it poisons the hearts of people and the minds of people. And the enemy can create a stronghold in us. Hostility, anger, come on, quarreling, fighting, arguing. Jesus, free us. (laughs) Anybody argue? (laughs) Come on, I'm not saying you don't get into things, but I'm talking about a lifestyle of arguing where you're fighting with people. You are quarreling. Nobody can get to you. You're just fighting with them. You ever met people like that? Quarreling, jealousy. Woo, jealousy. Come on. Oh, everybody got real quiet. (laughs) Come on, jealousy comes from comparison. Jealousy comes from when you think that... you know, everybody else thinks they're better than you. All the, it's an orphan spirit, right? It actually shows the sign that you don't know who your heavenly father is because your heavenly father, there's no lack. Yeah. There's no lack yes, in the kingdom of God. What you have doesn't mean I don't have. When you shine doesn't mean I don't shine. Right. Right. You know, if you can't celebrate someone else, you're probably je- dealing with jealousy. Yeah. That is not the culture of the kingdom of God. When someone wins, we all win. It's, well, it poor, it's poor self-image and insecurity. That's, right. yeah. That's where jealousy stems from. That's the root of jealousy. Yeah. Poor self-image and insecurity. Yeah, yeah. Outbursts of anger. Ooh. Anybody? Yeah, I heard, uh, You've been there? Come on, been there? You ever feel? Yeah, Ashley's like, no. Outbursts of anger. Come on. When someone just... We, I was watching this, uh, we were watching this testimony, and I won't go into his whole story. It's three hours long. You can watch it. He was an ex-warlock from Uganda, and it's amazing. But one of the things he talked about, I'm giving you the most brief version ever, was they were trying to break up a prayer gathering because it was causing interruption in the spirit realm. 
So he was assigned to attack these 20 older women who gathered and this young pastor in prayer. That was his assignment. And the way that they studied, after 10 generations, they studied who had an open door. There was one lady who had unforgiveness with her mother. And they sent this witch in who said, oh, I was led by God to join your, I felt led to join your prayer meeting. And this lady who, who had unforgiveness was a seer. The pastor didn't have much discernment. And he was like, oh, thank God, God's growing the church. And so this lady, you know, she goes, oh, pastor, the seer. She said, I, I, don't, I don't feel right about this. And then all of a sudden the witch looks at her and goes, you sound like your mother. And all of a sudden the lady's spirit man went boop and her flesh went woof. And she went at her, right? Who do you think you are? What do you mean? And right when she did that, this guy explains the curse could land because her flesh gave way and it infected the entire group they were in covenant with. We think that the things of our flesh only impact us. Ooh, help us, Jesus. It begins to spread poison in the body because when we function out of our flesh, it spreads like a disease. When we're dealing with something, we begin spewing all over the place. When we don't deal with that unforgiveness, it leaks out really bad. So outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, which is division. Division. The enemy wants to divide. He doesn't bring together, God brings together. The enemy divides. The spirit of God is unity. The spirit of the evil one is division. Division. So when you start to see division, run. Envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. He says, let me tell you again as I have before. Anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. I actually felt during worship, I just want to say this. I felt the Lord say that some of you are really struggling with pornography. And he, he's saying that it will not fulfill you. The pornography that you are entertaining in your life, and I'm not saying that in like a really condemning way, because you know it's wrong. You always feel gross when you do it. Um, I, I just really felt that it was so, uh, there's something in the room the Lord wants to speak to, is that you will never be satisfied. Whether you're married, you're single, widowed, doesn't even matter. What you're entertaining, it will never satisfy you, and you will keep you in a cycle of bondage, where you, you begin to hate yourself. So that stuff that you're watching, the Instagram models, the, all the junk out there, the, the whatever dating apps you're on that aren't healthy, begin to sever the ties. Just sever the ties. And if you've never shared it with someone, come to someone that you can trust and just be vulnerable with them and say, I'm struggling with this, okay? It's not about living. Don't let these things live in the dark because you know what lives in the dark? Only the mold that grows, grows in the dark. Beautiful things don't grow in the dark. The things that we're entertaining, I'm talking to believers, the things that we are entertaining in the dark will not breed life. It will breed death in your life. And you will suffocate under the weight of condemnation. When David was confronted by, by Nathan the prophet because he slept with Bathsheba, right? He committed a sin and Nathan addressed it. He said, my sin is too much for me to bear. What he was saying was, is, you've never been in bondage before, you know what I'm saying, or maybe you're feeling it now as I'm saying, and I wanna encourage you, sin is too much for you to bear. What you are doing behind closed doors is too much for you to bear, and Jesus wants to set you free. Yes. But what it takes, if you're a believer, this is what it takes. Okay, I'm gonna skip over what the Holy Spirit produces for a moment. In verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus, we have a responsibility in this. They have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Jesus doesn't just take away your sin, okay? I know we say that, he takes away our sin. Hear me out. We have a responsibility as believers that when we allow sin in our lives, not everything in your life is an attack, Come on, some of the stuff, the illness you're battling with could be from bitterness, unforgiveness. Some of the backlash you're getting is because you have an open door to gossip and division. 
Come on. I'm being serious here. Like, don't just say, I'm being attacked, I'm being attacked. No, you have jealousy in your heart. You have ugly things in your heart. We have to humble ourselves before God. When you repent, it requires humility. You cannot repent without humility. It is impossible to genuinely repent without humility. You have to kill the pride in your life that says, I can do it on my own. I got it on my own. Me and God are good. It's just me and the Lord. Me, 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 me. You have to humble yourself before the mighty hand of God is what scripture says. If you want the blood of Jesus to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, it requires us to humble ourselves and go, you are God, and I am man, and I need the blood of Jesus to come in and deliver me from my lust, to deliver me from the division in my heart, deliver me from the gossip. It's not about being condemned. Call it what it is before the Lord, because he knows. He knows. He wants you in all your honesty. I let Ben Fitzgerald talked about dealing with lust, and he said he fought it for years. I just watch pornography every six months, you know? Come on, that's real. Come on, that's real talk. Let's not be fake in the body of Christ, okay? That's real talk. People are just, I'll just get drunk every six months. I just get whatever, okay? Jesus said anything in excess is bad for you, even good things. Even your beautiful dessert you love. If you eat in excess, you'll get sick and throw up, right? Anything in excess is bad. But Ben Fitz said, I was before the Lord because I was so torn up over this. Why can't I shake this thing? And he got honest before the Lord and he said, I want to watch pornography. I have lust in my heart. I desire to do this, but I don't want to desire this anymore. And his honesty before God delivered him in a moment. Some of us, all of us, but some of us really need to get honest with God about what we're dealing with, and we need to do our part, and we need to take that thing and nail it to the cross. We have to nail it to the cross, and he will set us free. Right now, I want to break the power of a deaf and dumb spirit over the hearts of believers right now in the name of Jesus. A deaf and dumb spirit affects your ability to hear the truth when you are courting something in your life and you haven't yielded to the truth of the gospel. And I break his authority in the name of Jesus right now in this room so that you can hear the voice of the Lord in your life and not be struggling with something because you take offense because you don't, because God's found you out. Nobody knows you, but you, and God has God doesn't find you out. God shows your heart and God shows your heart because he wants your heart. He wants to command and own your love. Candace mentioned this fact that you, if you read that point there, Who nails it to the cross? We do. We do. Come on. Who nails it to the cross? We do. You and I have to nail it to the cross first. Yeah. Yeah. Colossians 2.14. Then Jesus wipes away the handwriting requirements that's against us. When? When we nail it to the cross. Yeah. You hear me? Because what does he do when he wipes away the handwriting requirements? He nails it to the cross, Mm -hmm. which means he receives it against the debt that he paid, vindicating you from that. Now you're washed clean. Therefore, he disarms principalities and powers and the accuser over your life. But until you nail it, till I nail it to the cross, he can't atone for something I'm not willing to. Yeah, to yeah. let him atone for. That's right. And right now, this morning, yeah. you're in this room, and your biggest issue in your life is you have yet to forgive yourself. Mm. Yes. Mm. You haven't nailed your self righteousness wow. to the cross. And you haven't looked at it as self righteousness, but you've looked at it as that you know that you have, that you cannot do this in your own. And because of that, you've failed yourself. You've, you're used to failing the expectations of others because somebody's told you you failed them and you failed God. Therefore, God cannot forgive you. And I will tell you what the Lord told me. How dare you think that your ability to forgive yourself is greater than my ability to pardon you? He said, I have pardoned you I have forgiven you, accept my forgiveness and walk in it. 
Come on. And this morning, I want you to realize that your sins that you're nailing to the cross, those things you will own before God and come out of the dark places of your life and say, Father, I have this tendency. I have this in my life. Jesus, you died to forgive me. Now, Lord God, I, I need to overcome this. I want to nail this to the cross. I want to deal with this once and for all. And I'm going to walk in the freedom. Even though I'm still in a moment of struggling, you understand he does doesn't deal with your past once it's been dealt with. He only deals with your present. Yeah. And, and listen, so if you say, I'm a repeat offender, have you gone to him in the past? Have you nailed him to the cross in the yeah. past? Yes. So what does God do? I take your sin. I remove it as far from you as the east is from the west. Yeah. I choose to remember it no more. Yeah. But I've done it, but I did it again three weeks later. And you know what the Lord says? This is new. This is fresh. Why? Because the old's been dealt with. Yeah. Now we're dealing with this new. Are you with me? Yeah. What happened to you today? He doesn't look at you like a repeat offender. He looks at you as a new offender. Yeah. And he deals with it now, nails it to the cross, atones you, and moves on. It's the devil that wants to rub your nose in your past. Come on, it's yeah. God isn't doing that. God's in to yeah. pick you up, get you on your feet, and let's move. Yes. Yes. That's the crucified life. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think that there's so much power in humility. Jesus lived a humble life. He modeled humility to us. And one of the ugliest things we can do is live an unrepentant life. Yes. Not just before God, but before one another. One of the hardest things to do is to repent to another brother or sister. It's one of the hardest things to do. Some of the hardest moments in my life have been swallow your pride and go repent to that person because it, it sets you free. I, John Bevere, I love the youth are going through Beta Satan. It is like one of the best teachings ever on offense if you've never listened to it. Because the church at large is riddled with offense and it's disgusting. Oh, yes. Guys, it's so gross. I, I taught a message, I think it was two years ago. The Lord gave me a revelation about the three offenses. And the first one, he told me the first one is our offense with one another. That it is the most low level of offense we can face. That is the lowest level of offense is how we deal with one another. How my relationships are how my relationships with my family, my friends, my church body, my coworkers are. It's the lowest level of offense. The second level is offense with the word of God. What I do when this book offends me. I don't know about, if, you, if it's ever offended you, you probably never read it. But this, this book will offend you. It will confront, I will read things and go, oh, that's enough for today, Jesus. Like, read the book of James, and it's like, look in the, oh, who are you to look in the mirror and then walk away and forget what you look like? I said, James, James. I mean, seriously, right? This book confronts. The truth will confront you. And then the third offense is offense with the Spirit of God. Come on, we've got people, I'm gonna address this because we're pretty charismatic. We love the, the spirit of God. We love his presence. You ever seen people who come in, they, lo they love, -na 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 -na. they love coming in and they, they wanna prophesy and they, I see angels and all of a sudden somebody says something, they're offended. Oh my gosh, it happens so often. And you can't even give them scripture. They're offended with the scripture. You know, they'll go, God gave me a word. I'm sorry, God, God gave authority through man so if you, you say, I submit to God, but I don't submit to God's authority, you don't submit to God. Because you don't understand how he has order. That's right. I just listened to a really great message by Brian Guerin, and he said, we want blessing without order, but God blesses his order. So the church has to come into order, and then he blesses it. He only blesses what he does. So when we step out of his order, and we've got all these people who have this mentality. I don't, I want to be my own boss. I don't want to work for anybody. I want to be my own boss. People are like that in the church. I want to be, run my ministry. God gave me a word. God gave me this, but I'm not going to submit to authority. Psh, I don't have to listen to you. I'll just go do this thing over here and I'll go preach to everybody else. But Whoever. you want people to submit to you. Right. Come on, come on, come on. Boom, mic drop, pastor. Come on. 
That's real for all of us. All of us have to submit to one another. The Bible says submit to one another. Come on, there's times I'll be leading with, you know, we lead with one another, we lead in a room, and it is my privilege to submit to another person. It's my privilege to honor the gift of God on their life. And if I view it any other way, I don't understand the kingdom and I don't understand honor. If I have to think I have the greatest ideas ever and that I'm just the you know, bee's knees, whatever, what a joke. Like God wants to set us free from that. So until we can learn how to be healthy and deal with our relationships in a healthy way, who do we think we are thinking that we're gonna to get to this place where I want a move of God? You're gonna get offended by the way God moves. Don't you and I have to live the crucified life with one another? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we just might as well get real. Right? Yeah. I mean, we see eye to eye all the time, right? No. <laughs> yeah, that's real, yeah. And, that, and there's yeah. a moment of yielding. I mean, you know, I mean yeah. I'm, not only, I'm not only her, her pastor, and yeah. her spiritual leader and her spiritual dad. I'm also her earthly dad, you know, yeah. her biological dad. And, uh, and she's, she, she's, she has stepped up and she's moving into the place of succession and legacy here in the house. And so we're, we, we're working towards transition and unity and oneness. And, oh, we have wonderful conversations. Yeah. <laughs> but it's healthy. It's very good. If you live in bondage in a relationship, because, and I'm talking about friendships, marriage, where you can't share what you're really feeling, that is not healthy. If you can't look at your friend, your spouse, anybody around you, and your family, and share how you feel in honesty, you're not in a healthy relationship. Because the point of it isn't that I'm gonna share with a heart of, you have to listen to me and you have to agree. It's not about agreement. It's about love and connection. It's about, hey, if I don't tell you this, our connection's in jeopardy and you don't even know it. Yes. Right? Isn't that what happens? When people get divorced, it's usually pent up stuff that they never dealt with, which could have been a car ride conversation of, you don't communicate enough with me. You know, hey, you don't notice me. You don't da-da-da. But they never said it. So one day they blow up and go, you don't love me. You never did da 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 I, I walked with a friend through it. And it was like one day her husband just didn't show up. And they never saw each other again. He just didn't come home from work. And the message she got was all these things since they met that she had done wrong to him. Wow. That is a lifestyle of offense. Yes. That is someone that doesn't know how to have a healthy relationship. If you have a record of offenses, yeah. you're deep trouble if you can if you can if you got stuff with people that you can call back five years yeah. two years one year ten years yes. jesus you need revolution in your life because the devil has built a house in your backyard he is expanding on your property and eventually he's going to yeah. overtake your residence yeah just just a thought if, yeah. you, if you listen when somebody sets up and has a conversation with you and you spew years years yeah on a person, you've been living in bitterness. Do you realize that most terminal illness, illness, terminal illnesses, most people with terminal illnesses deal with roots of bitterness? Did you know that the root of bitterness is unforgiveness and a root of, root of bitterness is one of the biggest demonic strongholds in a person's life where the devil comes in and messes with you because you hold ought against somebody and eventually sometimes you get to the place where you're so bitter that you're like a pus ball. I want to get as gross as you can get because that's what you are. And you need Dr. Pimple Popper to lance you. <laughs> but it's the truth. You, you're swelling. You're getting ready to burst. And God help anybody who bumps into you and causes you to release some pressure on them. Because, yeah. listen, I'm just telling you, this is how darkness works. In your, we're talking about the crucified life. Part of the crucified life is dealing with this stuff in Jesus. Yeah. Jesus came yeah. to set you free. You can't be free unless you're willing to turn loose of the stuff that you've been dragging around with. Yeah, yeah. You want him to come and just take it from you. <laughs> I love it. God took my cigarettes. He never took your cigarettes. You gave them to him and walked away yeah. and left them at his feet. Because you know yeah. what? Anytime you want, you can go back and get them. Yeah, and he won't yeah. play tug of war with you. Yeah. You yeah. didn't take your drug addiction. You laid it at his feet. Yeah. And you walked away from it as you walked towards him. Yes. Are you with me? 
He doesn't take anything from you. He receives what you give him and he won't play tug of war with you when you go back and get it. Because I know I've gone back and taken things back. Yeah. And then I could, and then here's the deal you want to say, well, Lord, you didn't, you didn't stop fight me. me. You yeah. didn't stop me. We do that. We, don't we love to do that with each other? Oh, come on. Well, you know, they knew I was doing this and they didn't chase me down and make me, you would have, you would have spit in their face anyhow. And you know it, but you want to blame them because you don't want to own your junk. I would love it when somebody, I would love it when somebody would come to the church and says, well, you know, and don't, don't get me wrong now. Don't, let's just Cinderella church. Come on, say we're Cinderella church. Cinderella church. What does that mean? If the shoe, shoe fits, it. if it doesn't fit, it's not my shoes. Okay. So if you get it, if you get, so if you get all messed up, it's because it's you. Okay. I would love it. I, if I could hear one time somebody say to me, well, I'm looking for another church. Why? Well, because I'm disjointed and my nose is out of bent, bent out of shape with the people where I'm at right now. And I'm probably in rebellion to them too. And I'm not going to leave well. So I'm just looking for another place I can escape to. Instead of saying, hey, I want to leave right. I want to sit down and talk with my leadership. Yeah. Make sure that if I, if I stay, I'm staying for the right reason. If I leave, I'm leaving for the right reason. I want to leave with a blessing, even if I can't submit to my authority. Because I, no, I don't want to carry no baggage with me into the next relationship. Yeah. I don't want to carry the next church. I want to carry my next friendship. I don't want to carry yeah. my next marriage. Yeah. I don't want to carry those things. I need to settle my stuff and leave well. Yeah. I said, leave well. And move in because how you leave determines how you enter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so good. Yeah. I love uh, Romans eight twelve says, <laughs> crucify. <laughs> Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, hear this. You have no obligation. Say no obligation. No obligation. To do what your sinful nature urges you to do. So when you say, like, I just can't stop, I just don't know what, actually, the word says you don't have an obligation to keep doing the things that are keeping you in bondage. Yeah. You don't have to live under that. You can look your sin in the face and say, I don't have to partake in you. Yeah. I can say no. Come on, this is like the word, I've heard it all over the place. Come on, Gen Z, millennial. I say no, I have boundaries. Well, put boundaries on Satan in your life. You put boundaries on people who are healthy in your life because you want to live in sin and not feel bad, right? You surround yourself with people who believe like you and think like you. Come on, I have a, I have a principle in my life that I think is very good. I have friends in my life who don't think like me. And I ha one of the reasons besides them being people I grew up with, but I have them in my life because they will look at me and go, I'll say something, I'll man, I I'll never forget. I'm going to tell him myself. I, I, was, I was talking to a guy a couple years ago, and I was like, I'm talking to this guy. And I was telling my friend, and uh, she's in the room, so whatever. But I was telling her, I knew I was wrong, okay? I knew this dude was like, no good. He didn't love Jesus. Come on. It was like missionary dating, which I do not encourage missionary dating. I've looked at all the scriptures. I'm like, well, Gomer. Lord, you told Hosea to marry Gomer. Golly, I'm not, I'm not the prophet Hosea, guys. Sorry, I just set some people free in the room in their dating life. <laughs> Dump Gomer. Dump Gomer. God didn't create another Hosea, okay? There was only one. Shazam. And thank Jesus, there's only <laughs> Shazam. Anyways, I said, yeah, I'm talking to this guy, and, I think, nah, 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 and I'm telling her, and all of a sudden, she just she does this look at me, raises her eyebrow, and she goes, hmm. And I was like, Oh, yeah. And I felt so self-justified. Like, I was just like, hey, 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 I'm having fun. And she's just like, what are you doing with this guy? Like, what are you doing? And I was like, you know what? Like, you just suck. Like, you just, you just suck the fun right out of my life, you know? But she just looked at me. She goes, hmm, you know you're wrong. And she just kept going, right? But honestly... You, you need friends like that. You need friends who look at you. I've had conversations with friends where we've, you know, you talk about some, that person really bothering me, then and they go, ew, yeah. why are you talking about them like that? Why are you talking about another person? I was just on a call, a leadership call with uh, Bill Johnson, and one of the greatest things about this man's life, besides being a great teacher, is he does not talk about other people. Yeah. Who? He does not talk about other people. His assistant went on the, she's like, I have never in all my years 
ever heard you say something bad about someone else. And so I had asked him this question of, you know, what are some of the greatest challenges in your life, da, da, da. He said, people and disappointment. And one of the things he said was he read a passage in Ephesians where it talked about fearing the Lord in one another. And he said, I had an attitude with someone when I was early in my years as a pastor, which is easy to do. And he just said, I was like, Lord. He said, their idiosyncrasies are bothering me. And the Lord was like, you need to fear me in them. Don't ever speak about them in a negative way. It doesn't mean you don't deal with your stuff and you don't address stuff, but don't go around with an attitude gossiping That's right. and just saying, I'm just saying that they're, they're wrong and I'm right. That's right. God wants to set us free from that. He wants us, we are all made fearfully and wonderfully in his image. So if I'm gonna disgrace you and rip apart your character to people, that means I don't fear the Lord in your life. And I'm actually saying junk about him and he will deal with me. Do you know what I mean? The Lord will deal with us. And I just love, just to close this out, if you live by your sinful nature, if you live by its dictates, you will die. We think these are just little sins in our lives. They bring death. The, every door, offense, pornography, drunkenness, quarreling, anger, all these things we know are not good for us, the door leads to death. All of them lead to death. Eventually, I, I love like criminal mysteries, you know, whatever. And every story they tell, those guys never started out murdering. Never. They never started out being, they didn't just wake up one morning and go, I'm a serial killer. They woke up, they were rejected, they were bitter, they had unforgiveness, they, they nurtured hatred in their life. They fostered, they let thoughts in their mind every day go on and on and on. And they started small, right? They started small. Maybe they started robbing people. Maybe they started being profane. Da, da, da. And it led to that. And most of those guys end up killing themselves. So Satan's agenda is, I'm going to take the smallest door in your life. Those stories always make me go, no one is beyond that stuff. If you feed the beast in your life, He's out for your soul. He wants your soul to be damned forever. But we have to nurture the things of the spirit and we have to begin to say no to the things of this world like we sang today. No, God, to the things of this world. No, I will not give in to the sinful pleasures. No, I will refuse to waste my time on these things. No, I will not give my attention. I will be powerful in you, God. I'll take the authority you died to give me and I will say no to the enemy. I will close the door that I've opened up in my life to what he's saying to me. No to the vaping. No to the disgruntled relationships. No to all these things that are going to breed death in my life. They are not worth my soul. And they are not worth my purpose. Because all of those things rob you of your purpose. You didn't get it stolen from you. We think so but we courted the enemy in our life. And therefore he steals, he kills, and he destroys your purpose and who you are. He is the enemy of your soul. But God has given you the power to take back who you are, to take back your purpose, to take back your identity, and to get back on the road, to get back on the pathway Get off the highway and come back on the pathway that leads to life. That's narrow. Jesus said, I, he has come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He has come to liberate us from all these things, but it still ends up a crucified life. Yeah. The crucified life, the death of the flesh, flesh dies screaming. That's so true. Yeah. Your flesh, your flesh dies screaming. What it means, I don't want to do this. <laughs> it's like going to the gym, you know. It's like going on diet. Scream. Your flesh screams. But here's the thing. 
when you come out of the gym, you feel like a million bucks. Flesh sucks up to it. You lose, you lose 50 pounds. You look good, you feel good. The flesh that you drug like an anchor across a coral reef that was fighting and kicking and screaming all the way looks in the mirror with you and goes, don't we look good? <laughs> so you can't trust your flesh to have a voice in your freedom. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Wow. He has come that you would have life. Yes. I remember one time, I'll stop with this, because I was in a bad place, really bad place. And my sister Lorraine came in one day, I was in my 50s, and she says, brother, I, I, I did something. God told me I did something for both of us. It was. She goes, I signed us up for physician's weight loss. Now, I was in a bad place, health-wise and everything, So, and I needed physician's weight loss, but if you know anything about anything you do in life, you got, it's a head game. You got to get ready mentally and emotionally if you're going to do something. If you're going to go on fast, you got to get ready. Yes. If you're going to go on a diet, you got to get ready. If you got to go on, you're gonna work, we're going to work out, you got to get ready. If you ain't into it, <laughs> forget it. You're going to be quitting in 30 minutes. Yes. And, I, and, my, and under my breath, I was sitting there going, how dare you? You didn't even ask me. I never said it out loud, but my flesh spoke. I didn't give a, I didn't care that she spent a couple of thousand dollars on something. I didn't even know what it cost. I was just insulted that she didn't ask me. But in 16 weeks, I lost 100 pounds. Come on. Yeah, I found some of it. <laughs> Once you get rid of one, you got to keep him gone. Okay, are you with me? But, but what I share with you in that is, 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 in that crucified life, there is, a, there is an outcome. But what Jesus gives you is permanent. That's right. What we do here is temporary. Yes. What I'm looking for is he's building in me a holy habitation Come on. for his goodness. Yeah. It's not about me just feeling good about myself right here and now. It's about me seeing that what I feel good about in him is going to carry me into eternity. Yes. Because I'm changing the baggage I've been carrying for a new set of luggage. And that luggage is going with me into eternity. Come on. There, there'll be a few things Ooh. when I leave this earth that are going to remain here on the earth. But there's a number of things that God's built up in me as a holy temple that's going with me into eternity. Come on. And I'm looking for the things that they're going to carry me into eternity. How about you? The baggage you have to drag, but God gives you new luggage because you're going somewhere. Okay? The purpose in your life, what he gives you is taking you somewhere. That baggage is dragging you in the mud in your life. Let's just stand. I feel like the proper response to what God is saying to us is for us to surrender some stuff today. Yeah? Yeah? Can we get real with God today? He knows your stuff anyways. But he gives us the opportunity to get real with him. And I feel like the Lord, can we just put some like instrumental music on in the back? I feel like the Lord wants us to get honest with him. Like I share with Ben Fitz, like God, I don't want to have these desires anymore. God, I don't want to deal with unforgiveness anymore. Jesus, I need to crucify this flesh. And I feel like today, I just want us to get honest. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you right now. Yeah. And most of you already know as we've been talking, as we're going through Galatians, whether it's arguments, whether it's jealousy, whether it's bitterness, yeah. gossip, lust, impurity, drunkenness, Whatever it is that your flesh has been feasting on, it's time to nail it to the cross. It's time to say no to the sinful nature. Jesus, we rejoice that we don't live under the obligation of our sinful nature. Thank you that you've come to set us free, free from ourselves. Oh God, you've come to set us free from ourselves. I thank you that the mindset of this world, Jesus, you're shattering in us, God. Just put your hand on your mind. Just say, Jesus, set my mind free. Set my mind free. 
Jesus, we, we choose the crucified life. We don't choose this self-pleasing life that if it doesn't please me, I get to say no. No, Jesus, we need the crucifixion to have life. We need the crucifixion to have resurrection power. Jesus, set us free from ourselves. Come on, lift your hands to heaven right now. Just tell the Lord right now. I just want you to tell the Lord what it is. Be honest with him. Just tell him what it is that you're dealing with that you want to let go of today. Nothing's too ugly for him. Nothing is beyond his redemptive power. You are not too mature of a Christian to humble yourself. Oh, bring humility to us, God. We need humility of heart, Lord. Crucify pride in your bride. Crucify haughtiness and arrogance, self-exaltation, selfish ambition. Jesus, humble us under your mighty hand. We surrender. You said if we lay ourselves on the rock, you won't smash us against it, God. We lay ourselves down before you. And just repent. Take a moment. Repent. Just say, God, I repent for allowing bitterness to come into my life. Come on, that's humility. God, I repent for allowing lust into my life. God, I repent for those impure thoughts that I've been entertaining. God, I repent for indulging in the pleasures of life. God, I repent for making an idol out of my cell phone. God, I repent for the hours I spend doing useless things when I could be with you. Lord, I repent for the anger in my heart. I don't walk in guilt or condemnation. I own my actions. Say it again. I repent. I don't walk in guilt and condemnation any longer, but I own my actions. And because I own my actions, Father, I nail it to the cross. I take those things, Lord God, that I've had an appetite for, and I say to you, I don't want them anymore, Lord God. And I, by an act of my will, nail this thing in my life to the cross. Jesus, I expect that you now will take that and you will atone for it through the blood of you that you already shed for me now. And today, now, I am delivered and I am set free in the name of Jesus from this. And I walk free of this now. In Jesus' name. Yes. I command every spirit, yes. every 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 influence of darkness that's bothered you in this area of your life to leave you now in Jesus' name. Totally leave you now in Jesus' name. You just say, you just if it's something you struggle with, then all you need to do is to do this with me. Just say go. Come on, say was that how you get rid of stuff you don't like? Say go. Go. Come on, go. Go. I declare to you today that he Jesus, who is in you, is greater than he, darkness, that is in the world. Come on. Be free today in Jesus' name. Yes. Be free in Jesus' name. Yes, Jesus. And we thank you that your blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We receive the blood of Jesus. And Holy Spirit, I pray you would fill every place. Every place, Holy Spirit. Begin to tell the Lord the place of anger. Begin to let the joy of the Lord come into your life. Just take a moment. Let the place that you were just set free from be filled. If you were free from pornography, God, would you come in your holiness? Would you come with your love? Would you come with your comfort, God? I pray for the lonely places and people to be filled with your love, to be filled. Holy Spirit, fill every place in your people, God. Fill every place, God. They trade offense, God, for a righteousness, Lord. Offense for a heart of love and compassion for your people, God. Lord, fill every place. Leave no place empty in us, God. Thank you that you don't just vacate, but you fill. You fill, God. You fill, Lord. Just put your hand on your stomach and say, fill me, God. 
Fill, God. Fill every place. In the name of Jesus, fill, God. Fill your people. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Yeah, if you need healing in your body, yes. if, you, if you need salvation, yes. what a beautiful time. You probably just got saved and set free. If you need any kind of prayer of agreement, ask the prayer team to come forward. And we're just going to pray over you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it sets us free. I thank you that your word does not return to us void. And I pray right now, God, that the seed of your word in our hearts would bear fruit, that would not be stolen by the enemy, that would not be choked out by the weeds of this life. I pray, God, that we would actually nurture this seed in our lives. I pray that this word, God, would bear fruit and bear maturity Lord so when those around us taste the fruit of our lives it's good yes. God thank you for setting us free thank you that you're our redeemer our healer our deliverer our all in all Jesus we just say we give you everything again God and God we say take this world and give us you take this world God and give us you so that we can be co-laborers with you in your kingdom, Lord. People who die daily, who live daily. We bless your people. We bless the city in Jesus' name. Amen.